All right, uh, I have started the recording. Hi, everybody, and thank you for attending uh, our reviewer orientation. It's really good to see you all. And uh, for those of you who are watching the recording, welcome as well. Um, there are a few of you who are attending due to Open uh, Ed Global over in Canada, uh, and that is perfectly fine. I would much rather you uh, be enjoying Open Ed, uh, a global Open Ed conference, um, and then watching the recording afterwards. So uh, let's get started. And for for a few of you, especially if you're a reserve person who's ever done um a review before some of this may be a review um you can skip ahead a little bit you'll know when the new stuff is coming for sure all right uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is talk a little bit about uh the grants then we're going to go through our rubric and how the review form looks a little bit of frequently asked questions and then we'll open it up uh, to everybody for your questions as well so first Let's do a quick round of introductions. I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. I'm over here in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Um, our program manager, Nikita Afaha, she's uh, newer. She started in May. She's in Canada right now for OE Global. So she's learning all about uh, the many global efforts on open education and getting some cool perspectives on that, meeting awesome people. Um, yeah, let's uh, start with Deborah Lee. I'm going uh, in order from where I see it. Hi, my name is Deborah Lee. I, I'm at a conference right now, so it's a little busy over here, but I'm the new reviewer uh, from Kennesaw State University. I'm an associate professor of instructional technology. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, how about you? Uh, I think you might be typing. Oh, yeah, OK. I think Deborah is typing her in her introduction. No, oh, hi. There you are. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to, I'm so used to Zoom. Um, so my name is Deborah Lee, and I teach psychology at East Georgia State College. Um, and I'm new to reviewing, but it sounds like it's really cool challenge. So I'm excited. Um, and I've done a lot of stuff with ALG for a long time. So I'm really excited. Thank you. All right. Um, Janet, how about you? Hi, my name is Janet Kaposko. I'm at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College, and I reviewed for ALG a couple years ago, and this year I'll be a backup reviewer. Excellent. Welcome, and thank you for being a reserve on that. Uh, how about Susanna? Hi, my name is Susanna Smith. I'm at Georgia Highlands College. I'm a librarian and instructional designer. And I've been working with ALG, gosh, since 2015, almost since the beginning. Um, yep. The library <laughs> champion here. And I've been on some grant teams, but this is my first time as a reviewer, so I'm excited about that. Welcome and thank you. Uh, Diana, how about you? Hi, I'm Diana. I'm a Georgia Sovereign. I am a professor of human anatomy and physiology. And I'm a new reviewer, although I did receive an LG grant a couple of years ago. So that's how I got into the whole LG system. Thank you. Um, oh, everybody is shifting on my list. So the order went out of it. Uh, Anne, how about you? Oh, Anne, you're on mute. Of course I am, because I did my cam hit the camera and not the other one. So um, I'm Ann Barnhart at the University of West Georgia. This is my first time being a reviewer, and I'm looking forward to learning about the process and working with everyone. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Antoche Jones. I'm from Albany State University. I'm an assistant, a professor of biology here. Um, this is my first time being a reviewer with ALG, but we did get that grant 
back in 2013. So that was a long time ago. Um, I'm also a reviewer for the City of Albany with the COVID-19 Health Literacy Grant. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Monique, how about you? Yes, hi, I'm Monique Martinez. I'm a librarian with the University of North Georgia. Um, I've been involved with ALG for a couple of years as the library champion. It's my first time as a reviewer, so I'm also glad to be here. Thank you. Um, Kelly, how about you? Hi, I'm Kelly Manley. I'm an associate professor of economics at the University of North Georgia. Served as a reviewer um, years back, and I'm on the reserve list this year. Thank you. Uh, and Catherine. Hey there. Um, I go by Katie, so I'm Katie Kleiner. Oh, Katie. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology at Dalton State. This is my first time being a reviewer, um, but I did receive uh, an ALG grant in 2017. Welcome and thanks. All right. Well, it was great to uh, see you all and hear from you. Um, and there are some other folks uh, who will be watching this recording and hello to them again. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what the grants are. Some of you have received a grant before, so you know about this. Others um, may be new to this entirely. So Affordable Learning Georgia is an initiative of the University System Office. Uh, it runs through Galileo, which is our uh, libraries for the 26 institutions. So it is a library driven initiative, but it is also uh, staffed by an instructional designer as our program manager. Uh, I'm a librarian um, and we work with champions at all 26 of our institutions. Um, on exactly what institutions need to reduce the cost of materials to students. And yeah, that's that's the main goal. The idea being that students have to pay all of this extra money. Uh, often they wind up without access to materials because of that. Um, with equal access to materials, this should contribute to better retention, progression and graduation, uh, particularly among uh, those folks who are not usually able to afford these extra costs. Um, we do address this uh, primarily through grants uh, to inspire action uh, on on campuses. Um, also, we're not just focusing on open educational resources. We're focusing on library resources as well um, and uh, low cost and no cost materials that uh, may be vendor provided or may just be there out there on the open web. Um, we are now working our way into research grants to look more at the effects of this. Uh, to uh, We've had quite a bit of research that has stemmed from many of these projects over the years, but we haven't said, hey, why don't you do some research on this and, and we'll help you and support you on that. Uh, we also do things like uh, course designators, so your low cost and, and no cost materials designators uh, for your course sections. Um, we worked with the system office on getting that into the catalog so that we can look at uh, no cost and low cost activity throughout the system uh, as well. Uh, there's, of course, campus level advocacy. Thank you to all of our champions who are here today, too. Um, and we do some outreach and some training, and we try to encourage scholarship uh, whenever we can. Now, some of you know OER like the back of your hands, and this is going to be a very big review. Um, yeah, so if you keep hearing this term OER or open educational resources and you're like, well, what the heck are those? Well, they are free resources for sure. And that may be the first thing that you hear about them, but they're also customizable. And that's super important in education because let's say that you've created uh, some free resources that you use in your course at MIT. Uh, if you're using them at uh, Dalton State, your students may be in a different place. They may have a different planned career path. Uh, they may have different prerequisites for the course. Uh, things may be irrelevant to them uh, in a, you know, a Massachusetts uh, standpoint. And, and you're over here in North Georgia and your students are like, well, what the heck is this about Cambridge and Concord and all that? Uh, so the idea is to make resources hyper relevant and 
affordable and free uh, for students. The way that open educational resources are made open is usually through a Creative Commons license. When you put a Creative Commons license on a resource, you're providing um, automatic permissions for anyone who gets a hold of those resources to revise them, to remix them, uh, to redistribute them, to retain them forever. There is no uh, accounts lockout kind of thing with OER. You just have them. No one's going to stop you from that. Uh, they should allow for day one or even before day one access for every student who uh, has access to them. And they all do because they are uh, provided online and for free. Uh, Creative Commons licenses are applied to the newer resources out there. The old ones, like early 1900s and before, primary uh, historical resources, stuff like that, those are in the public domain. That's a completely different discussion. If you do interact with public domain resources or uh, you're a librarian who knows plenty about public domain, that's awesome. Uh, help out anyone who, who you can. But I could talk for quite a long time about the public domain and then not have any room uh, for anything else in this entire discussion. Uh, so we will just say, yes, the public domain exists. Uh, it is often for older resources and for public resources as well. Um, there are multiple Creative Commons licenses. The first one um, and the one that's kind of at the core of Creative Commons is the second one that you see um, on the chart. It is the CC BY license or the Creative Commons Attribution license. The idea is that if you, uh, let's say, download an open textbook that was created by a team of faculty, at an institution and it has a CC BY resource uh, license on there. Um, what you can do is you can revise it, you can remix it, all of that stuff that I just mentioned, so long as you attribute the original work that you were using in order to create your new thing, your new remix. Uh, so you could make an entire video series out of an open textbook. Just be sure to attribute that original open textbook because those original creators should be acknowledged. Um, there, it's also a mechanic to preserve the history of a particular resource. So quite a few times faculty will be worried about creating something, getting it out there on an open license, and then having someone make a bad version of that thing. But if they make a bad version of that thing, they're going to attribute the original resource. People should be able to find that resource and go, oh, okay, this is a not bad version. Whoever made this new one, they were the ones making the weird thing. So that's kind of the whole point of it. Attribution gives credit to the authors and attribution allows for everyone to track the history of an open resource. Uh, you can add a few restrictions onto these Creative Commons licenses. And as you go down the list, you start seeing these extra ones, right? You can add a uh, share alike which means that if you are using this open resource in a new way and you've revised it or remixed it and made a new thing out of it, then you have to share it under this exact same license. And then um, the next people who use that resource, they are going to share it under that exact same license. So you're passing openness along to any derivative works from uh, this particular license. So those are really cool. The one downside is that anyone who is using that license now has to understand Creative Commons licenses and the ramifications of using them uh, immediately in order to use them because they now have to put their new stuff under that license. Um, Non-commercial means that uh, commercial organizations usually cannot use um, your materials and revise them and remix them and things like that. Really what it means is that you cannot use them for profit. You cannot uh, use them for commerce purposes. Um, the Let's say that you were just hosting an open textbook um, and it was a remix of someone else's and they had a non-commercial license. You put it on your site and you're making a lot of ad revenue from that site somehow. Uh, ad revenue doesn't usually work that way, but let's say that you were, you were profiting off of it. Um, that would be a misuse of that open license because you're making a profit off of hosting it over there. Um, it gets a little bit confusing with non-commercial. Uh, the good thing about it is that 
a company can't come in, take your stuff, put an attribution somewhere, and then sell it for $300. Um, the bad part of it is that non-commercial gets a little murky when it comes to things like print versions. It should be clear. It should be clear in the license deed for Creative Commons uh, that you can use a third party uh, company to create print versions for students. And that should be fine. Students who need print access should have it. And you don't need to run an entire print shop in order to be able to do that. Uh, the problem is that sometimes the print shop people will then want to sell it um, you know, using their own rights to it, like non-exclusive rights at a profit, they can't do that. Um, neither can bookstores. They can only sell it at cost. So that that's where non-commercial gets a little bit weird, but it, it is still a very good intentioned restriction. So those are just kind of the main building blocks. You've got attribution, which is on just about every Creative Commons license. You've got share alike, which is on some of them, and that means you're passing openness uh, along as it gets re revised and remixed. Then you have non-commercial, which means that businesses cannot be using this stuff uh, to sell products at a profit. Now, there's one more, and it doesn't really apply to open education. It, it more applies to artistic works and research works, and that's no derivatives. If you've created something and you don't want anybody to remix it or revise it, you just want the regular thing to be able to be copied and attributed somewhere else, um, and you cannot do anything else to it, it has to be in its original form, you would put a no derivatives license on it. We don't call that OER or open educational resources because you can't uh, customize them. Uh, you can't remix and you can't revise. You can reuse, you can retain, and you can redistribute, but you cannot change it whatsoever. And that just doesn't work for instructors who teach things in different ways, uh, for different students who have different needs. So uh, we tend to stay away from ND when it comes to these licenses. Um, yeah, ends then, uh, there are two extremes on this uh, that are either all rights reserved, which is you don't have a Creative Commons license on it. It is just under copyright. And then you have public domain way on the other side. You can voluntarily put stuff into the public domain by putting a CC0 license on it. And that just means you don't even have to attribute the original. Just do with it what you will. Uh, I took 30 photographs at Stone Mountain um, of the summit and the view of, uh, I can see Grayson from here, and here it is. Uh, just use them for whatever. You can put in your background, you don't even have to say I made it. That's totally fine. Um, if you want to do that with open educational resources, you totally can, but I think it's better to keep that attribution because then you keep the trackable history of that educational resource going. So I talk about OER because uh, not everyone is familiar with that. And then Creative Commons is kind of the building blocks of how to open license a thing. You are just putting the Creative li uh, Commons license on your work, and then it is very clear from there what permissions any instructor or anyone, any individual can, uh, can do with your work. That's a lot better than having to find out who wrote it, maybe send them an email, hope that they respond, and hope that they are okay with you um, revising or remixing something uh, after maybe a long conversation about, well, exactly what is it that you're going to do? Um, this gives permissions right up front, which makes it a lot easier for folks to use affordable resources like this. So yeah, um, that's just one of the big terms that you'll see uh, throughout Affordable Learning Georgia and throughout these grants. Uh, there are many examples of OER out there and they are growing and there are even more places to find them. Uh, this is a basic list of the big guys. Uh, so OpenStax is an open textbook publisher. They often make introductory materials or core sets of materials for a subject. They are really thinking about how can we affect the most students possible um, by a, a peer-reviewed textbook, double-blind peer-reviewed, uh, with contributing authors throughout the nation and within Canada. Um, the University of North Georgia Press 
creates open textbooks right here in the University System of Georgia. Uh, they help with OER creation. They can be on grant teams, even if they're from another institution, not just UNG. They uh, provide the, those peer review services, but they also do things like proofreading and copy editing, graphic design, copyright management, which is super helpful if you're using a variety of open license resources. Someone has to keep track of all that. Um, and linked resources, because sometimes links expire. Uh, yeah, the UNG Press does that right here in Georgia. The Open Textbook Library curates all of the new open textbooks that are out there and adds them to their collection. They are reviewed by faculty as part of their program to introduce faculty to OER. That uh, Those reviews are done through a rubric, so it's a really clear uh, depiction of exactly what a faculty member thinks of that particular textbook. So that's not pre-production peer review, but it is post-production peer review. Uh, then there are ways to just search for a lot of open educational resources at once. OASIS is one, OER Commons is another, um, the OER Metafinder out of George Mason is another. Uh, these big search engines that federate or bring in a whole bunch of different things together uh, to do one big mega search. Uh, open ALG is our place to host open educational resources. Um, they are all Creative Commons licensed, of course, and we're going to publish all of the new works from grantees in there. So why do we do what we do? Well, when we were talking with folks about possibly replacing materials with open educational resources, we knew that there was a lot of work that they would have to do in order to get to that point. Um, not only are you just taking one textbook and just putting it in in place of the other textbook and boom, you're done. That's not that's not usually how it works. You'd have to at least align everything with your learning outcomes and figure out exactly what you're going to teach on what day. Uh, there's a lot of revision work that goes into OER that doesn't usually go along with a revision cycle of a particular course. But not only that, someone may have created an open textbook, but maybe they didn't create ancillary materials along the side of it. Um, things like lecture slides or videos or those things that commercial publishers might throw in uh, so that it's easier for folks to adapt their stuff. They may not exist for OER yet. Um, and creating those resources, that's even more time that may even be uh, acquiring multimedia skills that they hadn't used before. So there is a lot of extra time here as opposed to just doing a course revision. Now, uh, improving these resources over time, making sure that they're current, they're accurate. Um, we wanted to cover that as well. Uh, the transformation already happened. You're using open educational resources or free resources but something's a little out of date. Uh, we need a new set of lecture slides. We need a quiz bank. We need, um, it, it depends on the course. There's lab manuals and entire videos and simulations of labs that could also be done. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could cover that alongside covering the big transformations from commercial resources to open and affordable resources. And of course, all of this stuff needs to be accessible. If you're making an open educational resource, it's not open to everyone if it isn't open to students with disabilities. So making sure that you have alt text on your photos, making sure that you have uh, structured text in an open textbook so that your headers uh, correspond with chapters and you can jump from one to the other in a screen reader, that's also super important. So there's a lot of time that goes into that, and that's what you'll see on a lot of these applications, how this time is going to be used, what member of what team is going to be spending this time doing this thing. So yeah, uh, because of that, we have our grants. Um, often folks are using and creating open educational resources, but there are also library resource adoptions out there. Um, there's adoptions of resources that are on the web and they're no cost, but they are still all rights reserves. They do not have an open license on them. And there are low cost resource ad uh, adoptions. So long as the total uh, cost of materials is 40 or under, this says under 40, it really is 40 or under, um, 
that uh, qualifies for our transformation grants. Uh, hopefully, uh, through the student impact part of the evaluation, uh, this would make a lot more sense. You know, someone is using a $200 text and courseware bundle, they are moving to an open textbook and they're using low cost courseware, then you wind up uh, saving students 160 uh, each at that point. So the review process, so let's talk a little bit about how all this goes. First of all, the timeline. Uh, round 24 is our first one. It's going to begin on Halloween, so Tuesday, October 31st. Um, they're due at the end of Tuesday, November 14th, so this is going to be a, a couple of full weeks there. Um, you know, midnight, really 11.59 p.m., that kind of thing. End of day is another one, but not close of business. We're not talking about 5 o'clock. We're talking about the complete end of Tuesday, uh, November 14th. And then um, once all of that is done, round 25 is all the way in March. Last time around, we had this way earlier. Um, the application process was earlier. Everything was earlier. It was really tough for folks to get an application together. We've pushed that forward. So reviews are going to begin on Tuesday, March 12th, and then end on Tuesday, March 26th. Now we have rubrics for each of the three types of grants that we that we have. And these rubrics dictate just about the entire review process. So I'll talk about each one, um, but there's a little bit of extra stuff in here that you won't have to worry about. So you'll see a times three or a times two. That's a weight multiplier. You will not have to add weight multipliers or do any math on these. Uh, there, you're going to be reviewing these by the rubric category, but you are not going to have to apply weights and measures and all of that stuff. Um, so let's take you through the rubrics of how these should be evaluated. Um, these are a little bit, uh, now that I'm seeing this um, on my screen, it is a little bit interpolated when it comes to the text here. So uh, I have put accessible versions of these over on our apply for a grant page. What I'm going to do is copy this link. I'm going to put it in chat just in case uh, anyone wants to see it when they are watching the recording uh, as well. This is affordablelearninggeorgia.org slash grants uh, slash apply for a grant all in hyphens. Um, you can also get there on our page by going up to the grants portion of the menu and then clicking apply for a grant. Um, the transformation grants uh, have five different categories to them. The first one and one of the biggest is student savings impact. Now for transformation grants where you are taking expensive materials and you are replacing those with open materials and with no cost or low cost materials, how the impact of that project um, is measured does heavily involve how many students you're affecting and the cost savings that you're creating per year. Uh, so you'll you'll look at the project plan and you'll see through the numbers that they are providing and through the narrative document about how they're going to do this, um, whether or not they're going to affect uh, a lot of students and create a lot of student savings as a result. So five is big old outstanding number of students and massive changes in student savings. Uh, four is pretty substantial, mostly substantial. Uh, three is around the average. Two, it, it needs a little bit of work. Maybe um, it would benefit from more collaborators, uh, a multi-course project, something like that. Uh, and then one is things are missing or they're just it just doesn't apply. Um, teaching and learning impact is also, of course, a, a very important thing. Um, not everyone who completes a transformation grant says that when they did the transformation grant, it transformed how they taught. It may have transformed the affordability of the materials and the access, um, but maybe they are still teaching the same way. It, it Maybe it helped them teach their, their usual way a little bit more effectively. That's totally fine. So that's why it's a weight of two. Um, it, it, it is very important to make sure that we are making big teaching and learning impacts uh, throughout our lives as educators. But this may not be the grant that does it, and that's totally okay. That's why it is weighted as a two. Um, so 
it ranges in the same kind of way from very outstanding to this stuff is completely missing or it's just not relevant at all. Um, then there's organization, planning, and feasibility. And you might go, well, if the substance of this plan is all about the impact, then why does organization matter? Why is planning matter? Well, of course, it needs to be a feasible project. Uh, we need to know why it is you're doing this, how you're going to do it. Um, what's the expertise that you have on this team to get this done? Are you prepared? Have you looked at uh, resources that are out there for your course and thought, you know, maybe we are going to use this or this, uh, as opposed to we'll look at it at some point down the line. Uh, that kind of thing goes into organization planning and feasibility, uh, making sure that you have a really good project plan so that when it kicks off, it can get done. Uh, there are two more categories here, quantitative and qualitative measures. So there are some basic qualitative and quantitative measures that are going to happen uh, as part of a transformation grant project. You're going to um, report as faculty uh, if the uh, perceptions of the materials by students are positive, neutral, or negative overall. Uh, if the change in student performance overall is positive, neutral, or negative, and if the change in drop field withdrawal rates or DFW rates are positive, neutral, or negative. So we're talking about the uh, a good change, a neutral change. Even then, you, you wind up with student savings, so that's great, um, or negative, and then we have to really take a look and, and see, like, okay, well, in this course, why did it go that way? Um, and we can put these together in our data too and be like, well, in, in Psych 1101, it's going this way. In History 1101, it's going this way. Why is that happening? Uh, it's really helpful to know that stuff. But other people will be doing even more qualitative and quantitative measures, um, trying to get some good insights as to how the project worked. That's really going to depend on the project itself. Some people have standardized uh, tests that are based on learning outcomes. I know Psych 1101 does that a lot. Um, I know that uh, some of these courses are way more on the perspective and qualitative side of things. And so interviews and focus groups may be something that they're doing to assess how, um, how these resources are, how they did, that kind of stuff. Um, the details need to be there. The plan needs to be there. Uh, yeah, it's, it just ranges from outstanding to completely missing. Um, clarity and alignment, it's something that is necessary, I think. It's something that's integral to the rest of this. You don't really understand categories one through four without clarity and alignment in your project. So clarity, of course, you know, typos aren't all over the place. Um, the structure of it is understandable. Uh, clearly presented is, is kind of the words that we're using here. But alignment means when you say that you're going to do this project over the course of a year, and here's the timeline for it, and here's everything that's going to get done, and then in the budget, there's stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with that plan. That's a lack of alignment, right? Um, you should be explaining the stuff in your budget within your plan itself. Uh, sometimes it's just not there. Um, sometimes you might wind up with a proposal that's saying it's going to do, uh, it's going to save students this amount of money. And then when you get into the narrative, um, maybe they are replacing a free resource with another free resource. And then you go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. It's misaligned. Um, so alignment is something that's kind of integral to the rest of the application. You'll know it when you see it, of course. Um, but yeah, that does uh, include a little bit of a score on there. It's, it's times one, but it's something that affects the entire uh, proposal overall. Now with continuous improvement grants, I don't have to explain all of this again. Hooray, um, organization planning and feasibility is the big part. If you're already using uh, no cost and low cost materials in the classroom and you wanna make something better or you wanna make a new thing, then the most important part of that is is the plan for you to create this new thing feasible? And is it well planned out? Is it thought out? 
Um, so that's that's your your weight of times three on that one. Teaching and learning impact because you're making something that hopefully will have substantial uh, effect on teaching and learning. Hopefully that should be part of this proposal as well. Um, and then, of course, clarity and alignment, just like I explained in the other one. What we're not doing in continuous improvement grants are qualitative and quantitative measures. Some people may have them, and that's awesome. It's not required. Um, and the student savings impact. If you're already saving students money with your implementation and you are just improving things, you have to look at student savings impact. It's going to be the same. Now, our research grants are new and they are it is round 24 is the first time that we've been doing this and we're super excited about it. We we've wanted to get uh, research projects going in a really cool way. We wanted to make sure that they emerge from our community of institutions and not uh, from on high. We're not telling people exactly what to research. Uh, we want to make sure that it comes from the creative minds that are at our institutions and, and not from us. And the way that we figured that out is to let the research grants follow the funding structure of continuous improvement grants, but include a deliverable that doesn't get in the way of publishing research, but does contribute to our knowledge base of how stuff works, how all of this has been working throughout our institutions. So um, part of the research project, of course, is planning out the research project. So that's, again, organization planning and feasibility. Uh, the research topic impact. Uh, so what are you researching? It, is that important? Like how, how is this going to make an impact on what we know in open and other affordable materials? And then alignment with the KU framework. So you're looking at cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions. That's a lot of things, even though it seems like it's restricted. Uh, the effects of cost go from just plain old day one access, how does it affect people, um, to the way that it might affect a student uh, when it comes to stress and anxiety and purchasing a textbook. Uh, they could have many different approaches to this, and those are all awesome. Uh, outcomes, yes, learning outcomes, of course, um, but we're also looking at things like retention here. Uh, usage, so let's say that you've been teaching with an open textbook for a while and you're going, well, are students really reading this? Um, when they do, what are they doing? Like that kind of exp exploration of how they're used is very important. Um, and perceptions, so there are some kind of long-standing beliefs that uh, folks, when they first hear about OER, may think that you get what you pay for and therefore a free thing is not good. Um, that's kind of a long-standing idea of our perception of our, our faculty perceptions of OER before they get to know OER. Um, once they get to know it, obviously that is uh, that diverges quite a bit. Um, perceptions for students, it would be the same kind of thing. Uh, there's a long-standing assumption that if students think that a resource is free, they're going to love it because it's free. Uh, but taking a look at those in very particular instances, uh, in particular courses, in a particular region, uh, that's really neat to, to see. And they, they've even gone further than this. Uh, there was a project at Georgia Southwestern that looked at the student perceptions of the instructor who is now using open educational resources in comparison to the instructor when they were using commercial resources. Uh, it was it was really cool. Uh, Judy Grissett was the main author on that one. It was is neat. Um, so yeah, we want to make sure that it is fitting into this bigger research framework that's been established by the Open Education Group, which was a national organization. Uh, and then, of course, the last part of our research grant evaluation is qualitative or quantitative methods. Uh, so these are not weighted and they're not weighted for a reason. They are all pretty darn equal when it comes to a research grant, but also it's our first time. So <laughs> finding out how these turn out later on and seeing if something in these proposals is way more important than we thought it was, that's for later on. We are weighing these equally at the moment. Um, also, 
we put in the footer of the rubric that it doesn't just have to be that this research is completely original. No one's ever done it before. Replication studies, uh, looking at things at a larger scale or with a different group, uh, that's very important to know in open education. There was a great study out of UGA on Pell eligible students and uh, students of uh, marginalized uh, races and ethnicities and um, part time versus full time students. And it was such a nice comprehensive look at everything. But that doesn't mean that it can't be done bigger or it couldn't be done more uh, it, with a different population and uh, that more insights couldn't contribute to a better understanding of that. Uh, so we're not just looking for originality here. We're looking for just overall impact. So the review process is actually pretty simple. You'll get an email on the first day of reviews, probably from me or from Nikita. It's going to have a linked Google Drive folder. It's going to have all of the uh, proposals that you have to review. There's a link to the rubrics. Uh, there's a reference uh, uh, link to the RFP so that you know exactly what folks are seeing before they submit the application, all the requirements that are out there. Um, and then a link to the review form where you'll be submitting your reviews. And it's a Google form and it follows the rubric. So the uh, categories from five being outstanding to one being missing and lacking relevance, there's a space for each one and there's an explanation for each one there. There's uh, a space for comments. Please do put um, detailed comments there. Not only does it help folks who uh, may not get it this time around and then want to revise and resubmit, but also there are folks out there who, when they get awarded, they still want to know that reviewer feedback because maybe some of it will help them um, do an even better project down the line. Uh, so comments are especially important. They look like they're one line, but if you've done a Google form like this, this is a paragraph response. It just looks like this. They don't give you extra lines. They want to be nice and uh, efficient with it, but often it looks like, oh, I can just put one line of comments. That's not good. There's a character limit, but it's not that big. Uh, I, I mean, it's not it's not that restricted. You, you should be able to put in some helpful feedback here. Um, there also are priority considerations within the transformation grants. They will be putting this in the application. It's also described on the RFP if they're collaborating, um, if they are participating with students, uh, if they are scaling it to an entire department. If they put that and if it fits, just click that checkbox and uh, that alerts us that yes, that totally qualifies. We'll keep looking at that. You won't be the first line of looking to make sure this fits the priority, um, but it, it does it does help. Now, the comments to administrators, that's at the end um, of each evaluation of each proposal. Those do not go out to anyone. Uh, it stays within Affordable Learning Georgia, including our executive director, Lucy Harrison, me and Nikita. Um, that's if something looks really weird, really sketchy. You don't want to let the uh, the folks who are on their ends know about it. Um, yeah, just let us know uh, through those comments to administrators. Now, compensation. Um, this works through a service level agreement. We make the agreement between the system office and the institution that this work will get done. Um, which is on the statement of work. The statement of work talks about these reviews. It mentions you um, and then it talks about exactly how this should happen. This is because we talked with the finance people. We talked with the HR people. Uh, we got a lot of questions answered for us over a couple of years when we were bringing this in house. And yeah, this wound up being the way that this can work. Now we do an SLA for up to 1,000 or not exceeding 1,000. Um, it is 400 per round for reviewing, but then it also includes the um, costs of compensation that the institution takes on. It's not that big or important to describe what FICA and FICA Med are, but basically they, on the institution side, they have to pay FICA and FICA Med cost um, on top of the compensation that they give you. And so we pay that tax cost to them. 
Um, otherwise, they'd be like, hey, what the heck? You're, you're costing us money here. Um, they can and they will withhold your usual stuff, your taxes, any standard withholdings. Uh, you don't have to do 1099s for this, which is uh, a complete like uh, hassle being lifted. But at the same time, they are doing the usual automatic stuff uh, when it comes to taxes. And we cannot pay anything to the institution until the service level agreement is fully signed and we have an official invoice from the institution. So at the end of reviews, we will send out an email that is the official notification that you have completed that round of reviews. That should be enough for your grants office or your business office to understand now it is time to compensate you for this round. If it's not, let us know immediately. Um, get us involved as soon as there are questions on that and we'll be able to help. Now, um, for the service level agreement, I'm not actually going to do an entire walkthrough on that. Um, I got to talk about research grants today that took up a little extra time, but also um, the SLAs were already sent out, uh, both to you and to your grants office contacts. Uh, we need their signatures first through an official signatory um, sent back to us so that we can send it to the system office and they can sign off on it. Once they sign off on it, that's what's called full execution. Um, we send it back to your folks and we are now able to uh, accept an invoice for payment when uh, reviews are done. Now, if you're added as a reserve reviewer, um, we don't know yet because the application rounds, uh, they usually wrap up at midnight with quite a few extras coming in right at the end. And we don't know if we would be overtaxing the reviewers that we selected or not until we get up <laughs> the next morning and see how many uh, applications that we have. If that happens, we are going to let you know immediately. We're going to get a reviewer SLA ready unless you are substituting for a reviewer at the same institution, in which case we already have a service level agreement. We just changed the name on the statement of work and it's a lot easier. Um, but yeah, if we don't, then we'll have to do a new service level agreement and we will get the ball rolling on that if we're bringing you in as a reserve reviewer as soon as possible. Uh, there are some frequently asked questions that I've added this time around because we've seen some interesting stuff pop up uh, over the years and some just general questions that pop up sometimes. The first one is one we've seen in the past. You should not need a dual appointment agreement to be a reviewer. Uh, you are not technically working for a different organization when you are being a reviewer for Affordable Learning Georgia. We have a service level agreement with your institution. The institution is compensating you. Um, that should be fine. Uh, that should not be that you're working for someone else or another organization or doing an external grant process. But institutional policies can be what they are. And sometimes they will want you to do that even though we say that it's not necessary. And in that case, you would still have to do that agreement. Um, but we are not uh, usually able to do much on our side about that because as the, as we've looked at our service level agreements, we say, OK, we are paying your institution to do this. The institution agreed. That's that's a little different than actually working for us and getting a check from the system office, which would be a very different thing. Um, are these reviews double blind? No, we cannot redact uh, every indicator out there. Uh, for where everybody is from. And because we're all in one big 26 institution community, even if you heard the name of someone's instance of D2L, you probably now know, um, okay, well, that's the institution. And then, you know, because of the subject that they are uh, treating, that it could be one of 10 professors who teach this course. Like, it, it just doesn't make much sense to try to redact them to that point. So what we do is we make sure that you are not reviewing um, a proposal from your institution. That mitigates conflicts of interest in the best way that we can over here. Um, if you do get an application from your institution, or if you work for like 
three institutions and we have one primary institution on there and you get one, you're like, hey, what the heck? I, I do that. Uh, let me know and I'll switch things out very quickly. Um, yeah, that, that should be totally fine. Um, how long should responses be for your comments? Uh, try to keep it within one to two, maybe three sentences, uh, depending on how much feedback you have. Uh, I wouldn't just say either good or lacking or missing. Um, that doesn't really explain how they could make it better. And we do not want to just flat out reject somebody and cast them away and have them never do an ALG thing again. We really would like folks to improve their stuff, uh, come back with a better plan, uh, with a bigger team, something like that, and do something cool the next time around. Um, so that helps those folks out. And then, as I said before, there are some teams that will get their award and then they also still want to know what the peer reviewers thought so that they can make it even better. So that feedback matters quite a bit. Applicants will not see your name in these reviews. Uh, you will be reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three. You might be the infamous reviewer two. Um, your scores, uh, your comments, those will be shared. Um, comments to administrators are not going to be shared. That is just between us over here at ALG. Um, and maybe between you if we have any questions about it. Um, what happens after you complete these reviews in terms of what happens on the line? Uh, we send that email out to get the uh, invoices going after that. Um, and a round of administrative reviews happens between me and Nikita. Uh, we send that, we send the final slate over to Lucy Harrison. She approves it uh, before we send out notifications to the folks who are accepted. Um, we can ask for clarifications on these proposals. So let's say that you wound up giving someone a pretty bad score because they completely missed a budget section. It's not there. I mean, that's a one immediately. It's not it's not there. But if they're able to write that budget section in a couple of days and the rest of their proposal is great, that's a lot better than having them delay an entire semester or maybe say, well, we're not going to do this again. Um, so we can ask for clarifications and then make adjustments based on that. Um, there's also the small chance that we look at a review and something just was read incorrectly or there's a zero off somewhere um, in student savings impact or something like that. Uh, we can override it at that point. That's very rare, but it has happened before. We're like, oh, well, this person didn't see this paragraph here. And that is what they're talking about here. So therefore, yeah, um, doesn't usually happen, but yeah. So some quick reminders before we open this up for questions. The apply for a grant page is going to be the center for everything about the application process uh, for all of the folks who are doing that. And I'm posting it again, uh, so you'll see it twice in the uh, Teams chat there. But yeah, keep the rubrics out of there for reference. Um, when you start reviewing, those rubrics are what the form is going to be pointing at. Um, we're going to be sending those proposals to your email on the day it starts. The review form is in Google Forms. If you are planning on reviewing things in a country with a firewall that blocks Google, such as China, please let us know. Um, we can work out a way for you to do that in Microsoft Word. Um, that should work out just fine. We'll just have to manually add them over on our side. I'm only saying that because this has happened before. Um, and yeah, let us know if you have any questions or any trouble along the way uh, through email. Both of us are uh, ready to uh, to respond as soon as possible. Uh, I'm here today, so I'm Jeff Gallant, uh, jeff.gallant at usg.edu. Uh, Nakita is away today, but she is at nakita.afaha at usg.edu, and I posted that in chat so that you see it as well. Uh, so let's open this up for questions. I'm going to mute myself uh, to see if anyone's got anything. Uh, Anne, I see you have a hand raised. 
Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for all those details. I did have um, a couple of questions, and one is under the student savings impact. I understand that you know you were trying to provide a rubric that offers enough um, specificity to guide us, but enough flexibility to not hamstring us. Um, and understanding that, I still am wondering, how do we roughly define a large number of students to determine the impact? That's a good question. Um, I think you may want to look at it at a per year basis. How many students are being affected per year? Um, if the student savings over that year are uh, less than the amount of the grant that they're asking for, then we're hoping that that lasts for a very long time and that they're going to be sustainable for an extremely long time. Otherwise, the cost impact based on the award that we're giving isn't going to really do too much. Now, let's say you have one team member and they are just asking for the amount per team member and that's it. And they're affecting less students uh, per semester, but at the same time, they're not asking for much either. You want to weigh the cost of the award uh, with the one year amount of student savings. I think that's a really good question that I think I should put on these slides from now on. Thank you. Thanks, and I'm just gonna, since my camera's on and I haven't taken my hand down, I'm gonna ask another question, which is, um, so just to clarify, we review the grants individually. Do we then meet to talk about anything or we just submit our um, Google form um, in just individually in isolation and you all do everything? Yeah, so you are just doing them through the Google form. Um, committee reviews are really cool. Uh, when there are external reviewers from like different states and stuff like that, it's nice to have everybody meet up and decide on a slate and stuff like that. But it's also a lot of your time. And I wanna make sure that we can do things in a way that balances the perspectives that you could share with the amount of time that you have. Uh, so that's why we do it this way. Oh, Diana has a question in chat. Uh, we don't have to sign the SLAs, correct? Yes, you are not signing the SLAs. It is the official signatory at your institution. Um, your business office, your contact there will know who to send this to. Oh, and thanks, Anne, for the questions. That really helped. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, hi, Diana. Hi. Um, I know you can't predict how many grants you will receive, how many grant applications, but what was the, I don't know, usual average per reviewer in previous years? So a slower one would be uh, ranging between 20 to 25 applications. A large one usually goes in between 30 and 40. Um, it typically pans out that, you know, if there's going to be three reviews per transformation grant, uh, if there were 33 of those, that would be 99 reviews that have to be completed. And therefore, we would almost completely top out on having 10 reviewers at that point. Um, if we go beyond needing 100 reviews, we are moving into inviting um, our reserve reviewers uh, to help out. But now we have continuous improvement grants, which have less reviewers per grant. Research grants are the same way. Uh, transformation grants tend to be the big, giant, detailed ones. So that's why we have more reviewers on those to get a, a range of perspectives. So if we have a lot of transformation grant ones, then yeah, we wind up with a lot. But our idea is we do not want to give you more than 10. Uh, it, let's say there's 101. If I ask somebody if they can do that and they're okay with that, fine. Uh, I don't want to do that, but it's kind of weird to bring in a reserve reviewer to you know review one application. Um, but it, we want to make sure that we keep a pretty steady workload, uh, no matter which round of reviews we have. 
Uh, Deborah says, do we receive all our proposals at once to be reviewed at our own pace until a deadline? Yes, that's exactly what it is. They're all going to be in one folder for you. Uh, continuous improvement uh, grants and research grants have one reviewer each. And then, of course, we are looking at it um, in the administrative review process. Uh, any other questions? It is three o'clock, so it is fine if you if you head out at this point. Oh, do we get a mix of grant types? Yes, we uh, tried to do that for sure. The way that we do it is we kind of cascade by type so that we're going uh, through the reviewers here and here and here and here. OK, we've hit all the transformation grants. Now we are going through continuous improvement grants and the research grants, so you should get a good cross section. Thank you, Deborah. All right, and thank you all for being here uh, today. And um, there were a few uh, folks who I saw kind of go in and out, so I'm I'm guessing at that point you might be emailing me about the uh, about getting into Teams, and and you'll be able to watch the recording at that point. Uh, so thanks for everyone who is watching the recording as well. Uh, to the few folks out there who are at OE Global, I hope you're enjoying that conference and Canada. Um, yeah, and hi Nikita, good to see you. Um, and yeah, I'll talk to y'all soon. Thanks so much.